Hello, thank you so much for staying. And I just have to, it's actually one of 500. Um, I wish I was one of only five. Did you say 500 or did you say five? Okay, <laughs> either way, um, thank you so much for staying. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I actually had a gentleman ask me if I was gonna make you guys do jumping jacks. Um, I, I won't. I think that the evacuation situation maybe took care of getting our heart rates up, so that was good. Oh, there we go. I love it. Do them. Actually, those of you that are here virtually, maybe you should be doing some jumping jacks because you didn't get the, uh, the honor of going out and uh, coming back in. Uh, anyway, so once again, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be here and so good to meet you in person. I want you to imagine a magic pill that would give a cancer patient more energy, better sleep, endorphins, reduced stress, talked about a lot of this already, right? Less anxiety and lower recurrence of cancer. Well, we all know that that magic pill does not exist but we also have heard a lot already about the great advances that we've already had in the treatment of cancer. Surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and often physicians are now recommending fitness and nutrition as a complementary aspect of cancer treatment. This gives a patient hope because often, as you know, Upon diagnosis, they feel alone, scared, and powerless. So as Shelby mentioned, my name is Jen Miramontes. I am a cancer exercise specialist, a medical exercise specialist, a certified personal trainer. I've got an alphabet soup worth of other little certifications out there. Um, but most importantly, I am the founder of Cancer Champions. Cancer Champions is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is developed to support cancer patients through fitness and nutrition, mindset, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. My why behind starting Cancer Champions and the work that I do with cancer patients actually goes back to my childhood. And I would imagine that everyone here, whether virtually or in person, has a why. You have a why for being here. Whether you're a physician, a survivor, a patient, a caregiver, an advocate, or any combination of these, you have a why for listening to me today. I mentioned that my journey with cancer started as a child. It began with my grandmother, who was diagnosed with melanoma and died soon after. Less than a year later, I lost my father to lung cancer. Next would be my would-be father-in-law, Nick. My mom was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. I lost my grandfather to prostate cancer. And then my best friend, Anne Marie Page, to breast cancer. It felt like the universe was sending me a message. I think it could have involved a little less heartache and a lot less cancer, but nevertheless, I understood I needed to use my expertise to support people that have been diagnosed with cancer. I sat through dozens of appointments with my mom. She had esophageal cancer. She went through rigorous treatment. She had radiation and chemotherapy. It turned out the tumor was too large for them to operate on. And after her second round of chemotherapy and radiation, her physician informed her, oncologist informed her that her cancer was terminal and that she wouldn't have a whole lot longer on this planet. My mom, a Bostonian, a New Englander, took this, it took this information in stride, at least outwardly. And so we had a lot of conversations after that appointment. We talked a lot about what was next for her. And I asked her at one point if she had any bucket list items. It turned out she did. She wanted to hike in and out of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yep, that look right there was the exact look on my face, the like deer in the headlights, uh, okay. Uh, so 
This was more than 20 years ago. And back then, there wasn't a prescription. There wasn't nearly the research. What we've talked about in the last couple of days, the research that we're doing now on so many aspects of cancer treatment, that wasn't, well, the physical part of it was not there 21 years ago. So I was looking into, like, what does this mean exactly? What I read was that a patient should conserve their energy. They should rest, take it easy. I mean, you need your energy to fight the cancer, right? Well, we know that the opposite is true now. So I've spent the majority of my life in fitness. I was in Junior Olympics as a kid. I uh, it started instructing group aerobics when I was 17. And yes, I was that one in the leg warmers dating myself and the leg warmers doing everything to like an eight count. And I was thinking about maybe actually doing some of my moves, but my son is here, so I won't do that to him. Um, I owned a, I won't do that to any of you either. I owned a, a, a fitness boutique for many years. I've run 80 marathons, so I should be able to come up with a program for my mom, right? I should be able to get her in and out of the Grand Canyon. Well, as I mentioned, there wasn't nearly the information then that there is now. But I did know that Fitness, exercise, helped me build strength. It gave me endurance. But maybe most importantly, I got that runner's high. There was that positive energy that came. Endorphins, they're a real thing, right? So I knew that that was something that I experienced. And maybe this could be true of a cancer patient too. So I got to work. This slide is actually my mom. Uh, preparing for the, the hike, and that is my then five-year-old daughter, Emma. And so as I was putting together this program, I started thinking about my personal training for, for a marathon and started to realize that really there wasn't a lot of comparison between running a marathon and trying to get a terminally ill cancer patient up and out of a Grand Canyon. But I did know you start small, right? You take those small steps to, to begin with, right? So we started with a short walk. And I think this is good for everyone out there to hear. There's always a starting point. We started with a short walk. That short walk became a short hike. That short hike became a longer hike. That longer hike became a hike with my mom carrying that little girl on her back because she was going to carry her backpack in and out of that Grand Canyon. One thing was happening under, like that was unexpected during this training process. It wasn't part of our plans, our goals, or our ultimate mission to get her in and out of that Grand Canyon. But suddenly, she had better sleep. She was experiencing more energy. I talked a little bit about how she was lacking energy coming into this. Her stress was less. She got to experience those endorphins, those, that, those happy, the happy energy. Her appetite increased huge for somebody with esophageal cancer. She had less anxiety. Basically, her quality of life, something that has been an overriding part of this conference. Her quality of life was getting better. Let me repeat that. A cancer patient, a terminally ill cancer patient at that, was having a better quality of life. And I have to say, as you can see in the slide, she didn't need that magic pill. She had activity to bring her all of those wonderful experiences. So quality of life, we talked about it a lot. I felt like I should just say, what is quality of life? It's really, truly a, just a general sense of well-being, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. Socially, we're here, and psychologically. Now, we've talked about studies. I talked about the lack of studies back when I was start, starting to learn this, the whole process of training people with cancer. Um, I do nerd out about studies all the time. They're my favorite thing. And I did find this quality of life study back in 2019, so not that long ago. Um, it was a 12-month randomized controlled trial, 115 patients with cancer, 45 did water exercise, 40 did Pilates, 
30 did yoga. The quality of life data was recorded at baseline at the beginning, right? Six months and 12 months. And I think this is an important note. The, the data was self-reported, so the patient was saying how they were feeling. This was not coming from me or a physician or anyone else, self-reported. The results, all groups saw a significant increase of quality of life and quality of life indicators. Pretty big, pretty great. Another study, oh wait, not yet. That was a precursor, <laughs> not coming. Cancer is a daunting word. The unknown is a scary thing. As an active individual, this came way out of left field. After the initial diagnosis, I had a few doctors give me their treatment plans. And at that point, my mind was basically mush and my stress levels were getting way out of control. My stress relief has always been through exercise. So when I asked Jen what her recommendations were, I kind of knew the answer was exercise. As my doctors were impressed with my blood work and my fitness levels prior to the surgery and all the work that I've done, I was more impressed with the quality of life that I now had. I was able to sleep better and I just felt great. So with the change in my diet and a ramp training schedule, I began to feel better and the symptoms that I felt before subsided. I'm indebted to Jen for pushing me to stay active during the process. Cancer Champion and the program that she has really does work. So what we heard from Dave was not only that his quality of life was better, but that he felt empowered, which is really critical in this journey, right? Empowerment, what exactly is that? Well, empowered people feel more confident in better control and capable of taking on challenges. Brent Clark-Holder, I'm a retired public health physician from working with the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization for about 30 years. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in the fall of 2020. And the surgeon recommended surgery pretty quickly, so I had uh, prostate surgery in January. Just, uh, I guess about six weeks after I was initially diagnosed. One thing I hadn't really appreciated much before is, is that cancer not only kind of affected my, my body, but my self-image and, and how I felt about myself. As, as I said, I thought I was in very good health and that you know I was pretty much invincible because I had been very fortunate and not had any real chronic diseases. Right now, my energy level's back pretty much to normal exercising pretty regularly and trying to keep on my diet as much as I can. Cancer Champion Fitness let me uh, explore how I could be part of my care. And I think that you can have tremendous inputs from that uh, and very positive aspects that can be extremely beneficial. And so I think it's highly worthwhile and has very positive contributions. And I think I'm an example of that. So as you heard, uh, Brent was diagnosed with advanced stage prostate cancer just uh, about two years ago. Uh, he, he as a, he's an MD, worked for the CDC, the WHO. He reached out to us because he needed help. He needed to understand how to navigate this cancer. And he wanted mostly to maintain his quality of life. You see, it doesn't matter who you are how much you know, or how fit you are, a diagnosis of cancer can leave you feeling powerless. You're left to trust the advice of your medical team, and you should, but you, most patients want more control, or at least some semblance of it. What else can I be doing is a common question for an oncologist or a urologist to hear. So this whole talk is on about the impact of fitness on prostate cancer, right? So we've talked already about how it can impact very positively people's quality of life. It can make them feel empowered. 
I also went a little jumped ahead of myself talking about research studies because they just get me excited. Um, and so I'm here to share two more really interesting studies with you. Uh, the first was on, it's a meta-analysis on the effects of, on mortality, effects of exercise on mortality and recurrence in patients with cancer. They found physical exercise can improve quality of life, strength, stamina, energy, it lessens fatigue, and lessens severe side effects. And this is a quote directly from the study. Physical exercise is an important adjunct therapy for cancer. Also, the positive impact of exercise during active treatment is noted for cancer patients with all cancer types. And finally, and really pay attention to this one, physical exercise can improve rates of mortality and recurrence in cancer patients. That's pretty huge. Also a study on prostate cancer found that exercise may slow prostate cancer growth. This is done in 2021, not that long ago. So researchers had 52 men do HIIT workouts three times a week for 12 weeks or continue non-HIIT workouts. So HIIT is simply high intensity interval training. And what it really means is that you do an exercise really hard for like, let's say a minute, and then you rest for a minute intervaling, right? The HIT group had lower PSA levels, lower PSA velocities, and slower prostate cancer cell growth. Also, they experienced better cardiovascular fitness. A lovely by byproduct to it all. Whoop, I made a mistake. I forgot how to make it go. <laughs> Double click. <laughs> I'm a rookie. As my doctors were impressed with my blood work and my fitness levels prior to the surgery and all the work that I've done, I was more impressed with the quality of life that I now had. I was able to sleep better. My stress level was way down and I just felt great. So yes, you did already see that slide. I did put that there in pur on purpose. Uh, the reason that I did is because what I didn't mention early on when I was showing you the slides of the, the people that were important in my life that had put me on this journey was that this happens to be my husband. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer just over a year ago. He's doing quite well now, I'm happy to report. He's had, uh, this, he's had surgery and he's recovering well and uh, his quality of life, as he said, continues to be great. But it also is just an indication of how it, it just, it keeps affecting us and impacting us in that whole universe thing. <laughs> uh, my why started with my mom's journey of wanting to hike in and out of the Grand Canyon. And I left you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. You get it, cliffhanger, Grand Canyon, mom joke. <laughs> we can have them too, guys. Uh, anyway, I am so happy to report that she did, in fact, hike in and out of that Grand Canyon. She made it. Uh, you can see by the backpack that she did carry her backpack, thanks to that little five-year-old. And I even got her to wear this silly, I hiked in and out of the Grand Canyon shirt. She hated it, but I made her wear it and take the picture, and I'm glad I did. I don't take that back. Along her journey, we discovered that she felt empowered. She got to play an active role in how her final chapter would play out. Her quality of life improved. She liked to say, I had cancer. Cancer never had me. In 1999, my mom was diagnosed, my mom was told that she was terminal and that she probably would not make it to Christmas. In March of 2000, she hiked in and out of the Grand Canyon. And in 2001, April, cancer finally took her nearly three empowered years longer 
than expected. Yep. So we've talked about my personal experience with cancer, and I kind of mentioned that we often need studies, research, to tell us what we think we already know. So my experience and research has shown that act, being active, it doesn't, sometimes when people hear fitness, they think, oh my God, is, are you, is it boot camp? It, just being physically active, that can mean that walk. Anything that just gets your body moving, right, improves quality of life for a cancer patient, gives them purpose and power. It reduces the rate of recurrence and can reduce the risk of mortality. I've worked with cancer patients, all too many that were terminal. I've worked with cancer patients that have had favorable diagnosis. I've worked with people in my hometown, in my home, throughout the country and even across the world. And I'm happy to report that cancer, I mean that exercise remains an important and effective component in the battle against cancer. No magic pill needed. At the beginning of this talk, I asked you about your why. And I talked about my why, my mom, and the knowledge that I gained by preparing her for this hike in and out of the Grand Canyon. My why has grown and evolved through the years, but it continues to be just as personal to me as the day this journey began. I thank, I, I thank you for being here and staying here with me until the very end. And I really hope that this summit leaves you feeling encouraged, energized, and mostly empowered. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Um, the question on, on the HIT study, um, was that HIT versus any other exercise or, or HIT versus no exercise? That's question one. The second one, can you make a few comments on nutrition and what, any recommendations there as well? Absolutely. Thank you. Great questions, first of all. Um, they, there was, and I, I would need to honestly go back and really dive through that study to make sure I'm answering it correctly, and I'd be super happy to share it with you also. Um, my understanding was it was just simply taking a randomized group and whether they maybe just r ran or did nothing at all, they were in the non-hit. Um, so mostly looking at the impact of this, this specific type of exercise. Um, so, but I will share the, uh, the information on that. And I love that you brought up nutrition because it's my second favorite thing. Um, and, and yes, I mean, you know, I think the answer is certainly eating well. I mean, the, the, the adage that food is medicine is, is real. Um, and I think this goes really, well, I know this goes for not just cancer patients, but for really any of us. If we can nourish our bodies with really great nutrients, then we're, we're going to get benefit from that period. Um, somebody mentioned earlier, I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, that there's not quite enough studies done on how it, nutrition impacts cancer. Um, so that one is a tough one to answer. But it's, nutrition is certainly a big part of our bro program because that is often what a cancer patient will ask. Is like, well, and In fact, my husband that I talked about, he really switched uh, his, his, I mean, he already ate fairly well, but he just dove in fully into the, okay, tell me what it is that I should be eating, and, and he felt a lot better. And again, I think it goes to the empowered part of it. Like, I'm, I'm, the feeling of I'm doing something for my body. I'm doing the, this part of it, the, the medical team, they have my back, I know that, and now what else can I do? So I do think that nutrition is an important component of that. A very good question. So, what kind of diet did he go on in that? In that so, case? yeah, the question was, what kind of diet did he go on? Well, he uh, he has a sweet tooth, <laughs> so he tried to minimize the sweets a bit. 
uh, reduced the, the alcohol, the level of alcohol that he consumed, and he wasn't a big drinker anyway, but a little less alcohol. Um, and then really mostly just kind of that Mediterranean diet, if you know what that is. So, so it's, you know, it's healthy, good healthy fats, uh, dark leafy greens, uh, vibrant foods, like eating the rainbow is kind of a good way to look at it because you get, you know, with the berries, you get uh, all those, you know, all the, the antioxidants from that. With the greens, you're getting all the great nutrients from that. So he really mostly, and quite honestly, mostly just real whole food, which is, is again, kind of basic, kind of going back to our roots of we don't necessarily, maybe if it's in a package, it's not as good for us. Um, but, you know, at the same time, he continued to live his life and do the things that he loved. He just was able to kind of make some, a little bit of a change in, in the way he ate, or a big change, I should say, in the way he ate. Thank you for those questions. Really good. Anyone we, else? We have a question online, actually. What kind of exercises are best for cancer patient health? I'm guessing low-impact aerobics? Oh, that's a great question, and it's it's a tough one to answer, quite honestly, because it's really not one size fits all. Uh, just like every cancer is very different, every exercise prescription for a cancer patient is very different. Um, so, yeah, if you've undergone surgery, then certainly low impact is is what would would be best for you. Um, but really, honestly, the most important thing is to do what you like, because then you'll actually do it. So if somebody enjoys the water, get in the pool and swim. Me, it's cold. I don't. That's not my thing. But you know, for other people, it's that could be great. Maybe it's riding a bike. It's it's really important uh, to find what you love the most, and then and find that and make that your activity. Again, every cancer is different. So if I'm talking to a breast cancer patient that's had a mastectomy, well, I'm not going to be giving her anything that has to do with like say push-ups for example. Um, if it's somebody who's had bone cancer, then we're gonna be very, very careful to do things like, I, you know, some of our workouts are literally sitting on a couch and doing some leg lifts, which is exercise and it's fitness and it's helping somebody that may not otherwise be able to get up. Maybe they're not mobile. So it really, um, it's, a tough, it's a tough question to answer specifically, but certainly whoever it is out there that's asking that question, please feel free to reach me. There's my info there, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate you staying and listening. Chubby.